recording. Okay, we are recording now. Now I'm going to go to share screen. We'll share the screen. I will hide the floating annoyance. Okay. Is that going to go away? All right. So welcome to the ICSU meeting for April. Our topic is carnivorous plants, as you know. And um, first, I have a few announcements and things I want to make. My name is Kate Hurlbut. I'm the current president of Ixia, and we welcome you to our meeting. So um, just a few announcements about some different things. Oh, my gosh. There we go. Okay, here's an announcement that some of you may have heard, but blanket flower has been declared a non-native. There has been some research done, and this, um, the citation is here, which will make these notes available on our website. Um, and the Florida Native Plant Society has officially agreed that it is probably not native and best to treat it as a non-native. And what up to you what you're going to do with this information. We're not going to sell it at our upcoming plant sale because we follow FMTS guidelines. It's not invasive, so I don't know that anyone wants to just run and pull it out of their yard, but just um, for your information, it's now considered a non-native. Okay, we have several upcoming events I wanted to talk about. We have our uh, traditional uh, TLC day at Native Park this Saturday, and volunteers are always needed. If um, you're new to Native plants, it's a good opportunity to um, Talk to other people that are familiar with them. All the plants at the park have labels. You can see how things look out in the real world um, and how they grow. Uh, Nick Freeman, who's our native um, park person, has a endangered torea plant that he's going to be putting in. So it's a, be a fun opportunity to learn about an endangered plant. We have a field trip coming up and a plant sale and the statewide conference coming up and I have some slides about each one of those it's a few things first off is the field trip to the Woodland Gardens of Faith and George Barber um, they're up in Bryceville so sort of northwest of town it's a really wonderful uh, piece of property and just a real treat to be able to get in there and see it there will be a number of endangered or excuse me a number of carnivorous plants as well as orchids are probably blooming plus they have beautiful woodlands and you can see the great picture of um, their boardwalk out into the wetlands because of both because of COVID and also you can see it's a very narrow boardwalk. We're limiting this trip to 15 people. My latest number I heard was that seven had signed up so far, so there is still room. But um, because of the limited nature, we're making this a members only field trip. So it's not until the 17th. So if you'd really like to go and you're not a member, it's a good reason to join. Um, it'll be a great trip and you'll see things that are hard to find in other places. And thank you to the barbers uh, for allowing us this opportunity to see their wonderful property. Um, fun trip, just I couldn't resist. Lots of pitcher plants and there's sun, sundews and bladder warts and great stuff. Coming up the next weekend will be our annual plant sale. It's our sixth annual. It would be the seventh, except last year we didn't do this. We will have both commercial nurseries and plants that are donated by members. The plants, it's going to be um, 10 to 2, um, and we do have a bigger area. Now we've got Native Park 1 and 2, so we can spread out. We're going to put the commercial vendors at Native Park 2, and we'll be at Native Park 1. And there's two things you can do to help. If you remember, you've already received an email about this, but many of the plants we sell are donated by members. And these are all plants that members potted up and donated. So if you've got things in your yard that you can um, pot up and bring them, that would be great. There's pots available at the park. We try to um, have sort of a standardized look to our plants because we are representing the statewide group. So if you're potting things up, please send an email to me or Bonnie Sinatra listing how many what type of plants and how many and then we will print up labels that we can stick on the pot so that the information is there when people buy them and so get us the names of of your plants and how many you've got and you know do, do your best things may die or whatever um, but we want things potted up early so they have time to settle in and then get us um, the names so that we can get those labels printed and 
What we've done in the past is just hand the labels to people at the previous meeting. Obviously, that's not going to work. So we're going to start early that morning, bring your plants, and then we will get the labels put on that morning. If you can't drop your plants off the day of the sale, get a hold of me and we'll make some alternate arrangements. So if you can pot up plants, that would be great. You can also help out the day of the sale. Um, you don't need to come for the whole time, but if you can help set up, if you help break down, be there during the sale. You don't have to know a lot about plants, but sometimes just helping people load their plants up to their car. So let us know if you've got a couple hours and can come and assist the day of the plant sale. And of course, come and buy plants. The um, Ixio does um, different things with the money we make from the plants. So when you go to the park, we have a nice big kiosk now where we can post information that was um, funded with plant sale proceeds. So it's a good fundraiser for Ixio plus an opportunity to get native plants. Okay, we also have our annual conference coming up. It will be a virtual conference. It will be in May. And there's lots of different things. Um, it's, oh, it's not on here. Um, there'll be speakers and workshops and there'll be different um, types of talks, talks for landscaping and um, gardeners and research plants, a lot of opportunities to network. The first evening will be um, sort of getting familiar with how to use the website and we're going to have a plant trivia. So that will be a fun, just fun. Um, we got the idea of Duval Audubon does a bird trivia and we thought, what the heck, it's fun. So we're going to have a just sort of a, you know, a virtual fun event, which, um, you know, BYOB, obviously. Um, so register, go to FNPS and click on events and um, conference. It's all going to be virtual. You can download the app. So if you want to listen to talks on your phone, you can. There's chat rooms and ways to talk to other people that are at the conference. So it should be pretty interesting. Um, a little bit different from what we've done in the past. I, it's not on here, but there will be a silent auction as well. <coughs> so um, we encourage you to participate. There's already a lot of people registered. The upside of, of it being virtual is you don't have to travel and spend the night somewhere else. So it's um, we can all participate. Okay, so let me introduce our talk and our speaker. And um, I'll read you what um, Jenny has said about her talk. This fun and informative presentation will cover the various types of carnivorous plants in Florida and around the world. Now all of them have learned how to survive in regions with nutrient poor soils such as peat bogs. These plants have the conundrum of ensuring that their pollinators live while their prey are consumed one way or the other to feed the plant. Some carnivorous plants are more famous than others, but this discussion includes all types, including pitcher plants, sundews, venus flytraps, bladderworts, butterworts, and corkscrew plants. So that's what Vinny will, Vinny will tell us about. Just a little bit about Jenny, if you don't know her. She's an Ixia member, she's a botanist, and a writer and an educator. She has a master's in botany and um, a lot of experience. She had the experience many of us have had of moving to Florida and finding that gardening here is different than in a lot of places. She's written a number of books and she has a blog and a Facebook page. So if you haven't checked those out, lots of um, interesting information. So Jenny's a real asset. Um, to our chapter. We're lucky to have her as a <laughs> member. And with that, I will turn it over to Ginny. Thank you very much, Kate. I'll share my screen. Oh, and I forgot to ask you, do you want questions as you go or at the end? At the end, please. Okay. okay. Okay, so um, before I start, I just want to say that if you are not a member of the Native Plant Society, please do join us and, the, and support this because we really need to make natives the new normal for Florida landscaping. And, the, and what Kate didn't mention about the conference is that it's a whopping $35 for a oh. whole, whole weekend of, of fun and 
education. So um, it's, it's not going to uh, be very expensive. I thought it should be more expensive, but you know, this way we have more people can come. Okay, so carnivorous plants. And I, I will preface this with say, saying that I developed this, well, similar version of this uh, presentation because I was supposed to be on a cruise in the North Atlantic last summer. And of course that was canceled, but I wanted to talk to the cruisers about the peat bogs. Um, and I wanted the one take home piece of information for the people on the cruise ships that you don't that, that you don't want to use peat moss in your in your uh, garden because it's never sustainable. So um, we're going to be talking about peat, what it is and how what the ecology is, the different types of peat all over the world. We'll be talking about the carnivorous plants that uh, Kate already listed. And then we, we will be talking about the conundrum of that the, that the carnivorous plants have of whether they eat the insect or the whatever, or whether they have a pollinator. And so we'll talk about how they do that. And what's shown here is a purple picture plant, which is not native to Florida. Um, this, I took this picture in Canada. Um, and these are the pictures and they are not the flowers. They are modified leaves. And uh, we'll talk about that and how this has come up several times in the plant kingdom. All right, so Pete, um, is is partially digested organic matter and it um it looks rich when you look at it it looks like great soil when when you look at it but it's not um it it is um let me get my it it especially the peat from the peat bogs is uh, antiseptic it, there's a lack of oxygen, which is why it never completely uh, decomposes. And so it's missing the soil microbes that would normally be in any other soil and organic matter. And the peat forms very slowly and it can build up in bogs and in other places over thousands of years. And that means that peat uh, plays an outsized um, role in sequestering carbon in the soils. Now soils sequester four times more carbon than all the all the plants, all the terrestrial plants. So if you if you take all the rainforests and all the other forests and all the other plants and you think about all the carbon that they've sequestered, the soil sequesters four times more. All right, so the, this is a, a peat world map. So we're going to talk about various types of peat. So wetlands are shown in yellow. So we've got the shorelines here in the wetlands where peat is formed. And, and uh, the salt marshes are subjected to twice daily flooding and draining and is populated mostly by certain grasses, mostly Spartina, that can withstand the salt and the flooding. And because of the frequent wash of salt water, there's little or no oxygen in the soil, which is why peat is formed. And what happens with the salt marshes is that the sediments come in on top of the peat and that the salt marshes can rise with the sea levels. So this is different than the peat bogs and that's because of the sediments. And so here's the carbon cycle uh, for a salt marsh and some, some of the carbon escapes is methane, which is why at low tide um, and there's, 
you know, it sort of smells bad. And so there's also uh, hydrogen sulfide that escapes. So sometimes low tide uh, doesn't smell very nice, but we have, what, we, what you have is the plants, they rot, and you've got the buildup of the biomass in the soil. So the, this is the uh, carbon cycle for the salt marshes. Now, mangroves also form peat. And um, what we have in the map here are the horizontal lines here horizontal lines. Now, in our hemisphere, we have uh, three or four different kinds of mangroves. But over here in Southeast Asia and the island nations here, they have a much higher diversity of mangroves, uh, 50 or so species. Uh, but they, uh, they all work the same. So here we have a Penacamp State Park, where you can see, where you, if you take the glass bottom boat out for a ride, all you see is mangroves. I mean, it's just acres and acres and acres of mangroves that protects that key. It's Key Largo. Um, and then outside of the mangroves are the, are the um, coral reefs. And what happens with a mangrove, especially uh, red mangroves in this part of the world, and there's other, uh, in the other parts of the world, there are stilted uh, mangroves as well. So what happens is that you've got stilt roots and you've got leaves and you've got animals, you've got all kinds of things and, and coming in here and dropping sediment. And so, and the birds are attracted here. So you have a whole buildup of um, sediment as well as um, the leaf drop from the, from, from the trees. So again, the peat bogs can keep up with the sea level rise. Um, and here is a mangrove with very deep peat. And this is in Belize. And Belize is on the Yucatan Peninsula between Mexico and uh, Honduras. And so they did a core of the peat underneath this mangrove. And it goes down to 7,000 years before present. So it was uh, 10 meters or about 30 feet. And so what happens is that the level builds up um, and we've got a tremendous amount of carbon that is stored here in this peat grove. Now the northern peat bogs are more than 10% of the land, but there are also uh, in the north, um, but there are also bogs in the in the uh, rainforests, and um, just in uh, 2017, they found a new peat bog in the Congo rainforest here that was the size of New York State. So they didn't really know it was a peat bog um, until they did some studying. But um, what we're going to spend some time with here, because the history is richer, is up in the northern bogs. Um, So um, over hundreds of thousands of years, repeated glaciation sheared off mountains and, and eroded the steep slopes, creating shallow basins and plains and flat bottom valleys. And these features provide perfect conditions for wetlands and peat formation. Other names for wetlands that were formed after glaciation include bogs, mires, quagmires, muskegs, and fens. And most scientists think that most present day wetlands here in the north were formed about 10,000 years ago. So here's an expanse of wet sphagnum moss in Quebec in Canada. And in the background here, you can see the spruce trees where the land is just a little bit higher. But if we're looking at the um, different types of things up here, we're, we're going to start with fens. 
All right, and fins are different because they actually have minerals. And so they are richer, they have a fairly high diversity compared to uh, a peat bog. Um, and this is because the fins receive their water supply from springs or streams, which flowed over through rocks, which is why it's carrying minerals. And so the fins are called, they have min mineotropic soils because they contain more minerals compared to there's a higher diversity of plants and wetland adapted grasses and other herbaceous flowering plants, plus, plus a few shrubs and, and, and trees. Now, Myers are, on the other hand, um, receive water from only precipitation, the, the rain and the snow. And these soils are called ombrotropic, which means cloud fed. And so there is no water running over rocks. So there's, there's no nutrients that, or can, that is in this water. So the bogs mostly began as ponds and small lakes called cattle holes. And that's because of the way the glaciers left the land there. And um, they just don't receive any minerals or other nutrients because the rain doesn't bring any. So they're nutrient poor. So what happens is that you end up with sphagnum moss, which has a, which is, um, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but the spores are everywhere. So the moss comes in and it settles in and it begins to settle in and then it comes out over the water. And it's a very slow process. Um, the bogs that still have a lens of water underneath them when you walk out on it, um, it, it shakes. So those are called quaking bogs. Um, also, the peat builds up. It fills in the water areas, and it becomes more like land. And so this is called terrestrialization. So what happens is that that kettle hole that was a lake or a pond becomes a peat bog. All right, so, so let's look at the sphagnum moss itself. Now well, there's more than 300 species of sphagnum moss, but the differences between them are so small that you need a microscope to determine which species is which. So the sphagnum are true mosses. They're non-flowering plants and they reproduce with spores, which are carried in for distances, which I, which I mentioned. So those spores are all in, in all kinds of places. And have you noticed that mosses are never tall? Well, that's because they don't have any xylem or phloem. They're, they're not vascular plants. The, that they have to stay close to the moisture because there is no tubes to carry the water to higher, higher altitude. And the top of, a, of the sphagnum moss consists of tightly clustered side branches, which emerge the following season. And along the stems are many leaves. And those leaves consist of two kinds of cells. The small green living cells, and those are called chlorophyllous cells. These are the living cells. And then there's the hyaline cells, which are the structural cells that store water. And because of its um, because uh, the hyaline cells help the sphagnum moss tolerate drier conditions by storing water, but they also contribute to the large water holding capacity of this moss after it's dead. And because of its abundance in Northern Eurasia, the early peoples relied on it for many uses, especially burning as a fuel, since trees were not that uh, numerous in that part of the world. Now, it, it, um, it, the mining has continued and still continues today, and it's continued for centuries. And it, again, it's mostly used for burning. 
And this photo shows an extraction of peat from a derelict blanket bog, blanket bog, blanket bog in Scotland. And this old bog is no longer forming peat because the vegetation has changed. It's no longer a bog. But as people have extracted peat over the centuries, sometimes they found surprises. They'd find whole bodies in the peat. And because of the extreme acidity, the bones dissolve, but the skin and the hair does not dissolve because this, the peat is antiseptic. And the bodies have been named based on their places of extraction. So the Tolundman is one of the more famous in, in, uh, in Denmark. And sometimes the peat harvesters also found globs of butter in the peat, which has probably been stored there for safekeeping or maybe to preserve it because um, these were days when there was no refrigeration. So today the, the, the peat harvesting continues um, both in Eurasia and in Canada. But whether by hand cutting or machine vacuuming, the peat harvesting rate is far greater than the deposition rate, which is one millimeter per year. And we'll come back to that in a minute. Now there were and are many uses for peat moss. So it was dried and used for fuel. And because of the ho hollow hyaline cells, it burns evenly. And it was used for fuel in ancient times and even today. Plus peat bogs can burn now because of warmer temperatures and the wildfires in the Arctic are becoming more common. But since the peat burns now because it's too dry, then the fires in the Arctic can burn for months and months. But peat fires, controlled peat fires are essential for one iconic product from Scotland. Scotch whiskey. So the Scotch whiskey is made from peated malt. So <laughs> what the heck is peated malt? Well, malt is a germinated cereal grain that has been dried and killed in a process known as malting. So this is barley, which is what they use for the whiskey. And they cause it to germinate by soaking it in water, and then they kill it with peat smoke. Um, and this, it's this malt that is fermented and distilled to produce whiskey. Now, other whiskeys can also be made from peated malt, but they can't be called scotch unless they're made in Scotland. Also, Peat was important in World War I because it's antiseptic um, and it's sterile because of, and because of the high line cells, it's highly absorbent. Um, and it certainly it was widely available in Northern Europe. So in 1916, during World War I, the Red Cross created field dressing packets of peat moss and each pack contained two bags of peat and these were sewn into the soldiers uniforms and this way the soldiers could apply these sterile dressings to their own wounds if they were conscious or to wounds of their fellow soldiers and this made a huge difference in the survival rate for the wounded soldiers. But after the war, the women of the Red Cross who had made those pads for the field dressings redesigned them for their own use. It was tricky marketing the sanitary napkins because the box and the advertisements could not suggest in any way what the heck it was for. So they had the drawing of the Red Cross woman on the outside and I guess the women had to figure out what they were for. But so the first sanitary napkins were made of sphagnum moss. I think that's really interesting. But peat has been widely used in gardening, both as a sterile soil amendment to increase the retention rate of moisture and mold it into peat pots and line, liners there? for hanging gardens. Are somebody, you there? Somebody needs to okay. mute, mute 
somebody needs to mute their um, somebody needs to mute their their microphone. Please, everybody, mute, mute yourself. Um, well, the advantages are that it's sterile, so the seedlings are not going to be attacked by fungal wilts. Um, the disadvantage. The disadvantages are that it's not a renewable resource. It can never be harvested sustainably. So as it's mined, all that stored carbon will be released as you use it in your garden. And those ecosystems will not recover fast enough to start absorbing the peat again. The other big disadvantage as a gardener is that once it dries out, it's very hard to wet. It's what we'd call hydrophobic. And that peat is extremely acidic and has no nutrition available for the plants, none. And acidity also inhibits the growth of soil microbes. Now, in organic gardening, we want to have microbes in our soil um, in order to have a garden with healthy plants. But the peat moss would inhibit that. So there are alternatives such as coconut core made of coconut husks, which is a waste product from uh, the coconuts, which are already harvested. But the fact that peat offers no nutrients for plants brings us to our main topic for today. If you look at a peat bog, there is not very much diversity a few grasses, the sphagnum moss, because the soil is so acidic that the nutrients are not available to most plants. And even though when you look at a handful of peat moss, it looks like nice rich soil, it's not. So most plants cannot survive in peat moss without another source of nutrients. And now even though plants don't have brains as we know them, they figured out how to get things done and they, plants evolved several strategies to grab their nutrients from the air or the water instead of the soil. These are carnivorous plants. There are three main methods for trapping insects, spiders, mites, and even small vertebrates like um, frogs. Now I'm gonna use the term bug to refer to all of these creeping and flying organisms, even though ent entomologists think of bugs as only one kind of insect, I'm just going to use it in a broad sense. So apologies to the entomologists. But the pitcher plants trap their bugs in the liquid in their pitchers, and they have downward pointing hairs, so the bugs get stuck in the pitcher and they sound. The sundews trap the bugs with sticky globs on their hairs. And the bladder warts have underwater traps to catch bug larvae, frogs and toad larvae and small fish. So let's take a look at, at more details of some of these fascinating plants and see how they work. Okay, there are a number of pitcher plant species in the Saracenia genus. All are native to North America, including Florida. So we have several Saracenia pitcher plants that are native here. And one of our chapters out in the panhandle is the Saracenia chapter. Um, and as you hike through bogs or on, on elevated uh, walkways, these are the carnivorous, carnivorous plants or the carnivores that you are most likely to see because they're relatively large. So you've got the various parts, you've got the operculum, which is on top, and then you've got the tube in here, and this is where the water settles. So what you have here are downward pointing hairs so that the bugs would have a hard time crawling out. And the bugs are attracted to these traps by odors. And there's nectar on the rims of these plants. And, some, and there are some ultraviolet colors that we can't see, but the bugs can. 
And when they fall in, they're digested and the plant is then able to absorb the nitrogen, phosphorus and other nutrients. And the nutrients are then sent down to the roots and are then used by the plant as if it had absorbed it from the soil. So the liquid in these pitcher plants is mostly rainwater. So here are, here are the ultraviolet uh, rims that we can't see, but they're part of the attraction for, for the prey to fall in. But things are more complicated. There are at least 165 species of insects, protozoa, algae, and other organisms that can live in the pitcher's waters. A pitcher plant mosquito is obligated to lay its eggs in the pitcher plant water. Its underwater larvae, the naiads, live off the trapped prey and the various microbes and the waste and the detritus from all of the organisms provides the nutrients for the plants. So what about their pollinators? Well, um, this has been a topic for study for many years and there are several methods that carnivorous plants use, but for those pitcher plants, the blooms are on a stalk that's much higher than the pitcher. So, and the odors emitted from the flower are different than those that are emitted from the pitcher. So there is very little overlap between the insect species that are attracted to the flower for pollination and those that are attracted to the pitcher that are going to be digested. Now the modified leaves of the pitcher seems like it might be unique in the plant world because look at these leaves, they're just fantastic. But no, we found these pictures on a vine, on vines in the Seychelles Islands in the Indian Ocean. The, these, are, uh, these are called tropical pitcher plants. They're about 170 different species and they're native to Madagascar um, and to various nations in Southeast Asia. And they are not related in any way to the pitcher plants in North America. They have their own family and there are no other genera in this family. They are uh, monotypic so that they are the only genus in this family. Uh, but these plants uh, secrete acid into their pitchers and the lids close when it rains. So what the liquid in these pitcher plants is more acidic. So the plants do their own digesting. They don't depend upon a whole ecosystem the way the Saracenia pitcher plants do on our side of the world. Um, and, and again, the flowers here are different, but we didn't see any flowers when we saw these. Um, but um, again, they're going to be separated from the pitchers so that, again, you're not going to have too much overlap in between the prey and the predator. And then there's a third unrelated pitcher plant in a small area in Southwest Australia near Albany. And it's called Albany in Australia, not Albany like New York. And it's one species. And again, this is the only member in the plant family. And the natural habitat there is the peat and sand beds along the streams and creek. We've been to Albany, so next time we go, this is going to be on our uh, to-do list, is to see if we can find some of these pitcher plants. And so here we have a case of three unrelated plants that have all created the same type of modified leaves, highly modified leaves, to trap insects. And so what we have here is a case of convergent evolution where because of the poor nutrients in the soil, 
trapping the insects one way or another is so advantageous that the plants who developed or the plants that developed these pitchers were able to survive um, in poor soil. Okay, so let's move on to the next type of carnivorous plant, the sundews. There are more than 190 species of sundews and they lure or capture and digest insects using stalked mucilaginous glands covering their leaf surfaces. Now the flowers are held high. So again, there's a separation of the pollinators and the prey. Um, now these leaves are more active than the pitcher plants. The pitcher plants basically, <clears throat> they, don't move, they don't move. These plants do. So what you have here is they have all these droplets and these droplets are sticky. But when an insect or something else gets stuck on one of these trichomes here, then the, then the leaf bends over, putting more and more of these sticky glands next to, next to the insect. And then there's a change in the secretion so that the digestive enzymes are then secreted from these same trichomes. So what's, what's here without an insect is sticky and, and attracts the insects. But then once the insect is there, then the plant, once it senses that, changes the fluid so that it digests the insect on the outside of its leaf. So the folded leaf here basically becomes a functioning stomach. Then the sessile glands on the leaf absorb the resulting nutrients. So here's a graphic of that. So here we have sti sticky substance on these trichomes or, or cell stalk cells. And then there's another reservoir cell underneath it. So when this is disturbed, then this liquid, which is the digestive liquid, is then shot up into here to absorb the, or to digest the insect. And then there's sessile glands on the surface of the leaves that absorb the digested insect. I think that's really fascinating. And the sundews have a very wide distribution across the world. I mean, look at that. It's a huge distribution, including Florida. And the people who go on that on the uh, field trip will see some of these. But again, you have your flowers held high away from the lures for the insects. The most famous member of the sundew family is the Venus flytrap. Um, and what happens here is that you have these trigger hairs and if three or more of them are triggered, then the, the leaves close and form a trap to trap the prey. This movement can begin in a, a tiny fraction of a second so that it doesn't close if water drops on it, like if it's raining, it has to be several, it has to be two or three of these trigger hairs before the plant spends the energy to close, to close that leaf. So um, this is again, the most famous of the sundews. So, while they're famous, or again, here you've got your flowers way up high and the fly traps way down here. So you do have um, separation of pollinator and prey. But as famous as they are, they're famous worldwide. They're only native to the Carolinas. But you can see here, it's been introduced to Florida. 
but they're not they're not native here. The water wheel plant is also a sundew, and it's an aquatic plant with traps similar to the Venus flytrap, except that the traps are underwater. <clears throat> and the traps are smaller and faster. <clears throat> and their prey is aquatic animals. So it could be insect naiads, or it could be minnows, or other um, protozoa, or whatever is floating around. So what happens here is that it's like the Venus flytrap, except underwater. <coughs> it's much easier to separate the pollinators and the prey because the flower sticks up out of the water while the prey are under the water. So um, it's a very quick uh, uh, trap. So this is native not to our hemisphere, but to Europe, parts of Africa, and parts of Australia and Asia. So this is a water wheel plant. Yep. The bladder warts is our last family of, of um, and our largest family of, of, of both aquatic and terrestrial plants. And the bladders have hair triggers like the water wheel plant. And when stimulating, they will open the lid and expand the, expand the, the trap that sucks in the prey. But look at the distribution of the bladder warts, even wider than the sundews. So it's worldwide, um, more than 200 species. Um, it's, it's very interesting. So here's a close up of those of those traps and, and usually what you have is is a stem here with a series of traps. So they would eat um, as again naiads or protozoa or anything that um, that floats that floats near it. And the flowers we have um, with more than 200 species, there's quite a bit of variation in the bladder wart family. And so see here, you've got what's underwater here are the bladders down here. So these are not roots. These are modified leaves. Also in the bladder wart family are the butter warts. And again, we have them here in Florida, but Again, they have a fairly wide distribution. And the butter warts are, there's about 80 species of them, and they live in nutrient poor environments, including fens and rocky surfaces like this, and acidic peat bogs. And the highest butter wart diversity is in Central America and Northern South America. So the diversity is higher here than anywhere else where over in Europe, there's only a few different species. And so here they've got the same kind of trigger hairs that you'd find on the sundews. So here you've got some insects that are, um, are trapped and the digestive juices would be um, come out of the hairs and then the sessile glands. So this works in the same way as, as, the, as the sundews. And one final member of the bladderwort family is the corkscrew plant. And there are about 30 or so species and they grow in wet terrestrial to semi-aquatic environments. And from above ground appearance, they look like regular normal plants and they put their flowers held high. Uh, um, but they don't have any roots. They have only modified leaves um, that attract and digest microfauna, particularly protozoans in the soil. And, uh, and Charles Darwin suggested that, that, that these were carnivorous, but it wasn't proven 
until 20 years ago. So 1998, that they finally proved that these modified leaves that act as roots were actually ingesting, actively ingesting protozoa and other soil organisms. And they are native farther south from Cuba down to South America and then in Africa. So th these are really weird. But speaking of Darwin, carnivorous plants were so interesting and weird that Charles Darwin wrote a whole book about the ones that he had found on his travels. He was particularly intrigued that plants had found multiple methods of attracting and trapping prey. And he wrote in his autobiography that the fact that a plant should secrete when properly excited a fluid containing an acid and ferment closely analogous to the digestive fluid of an animal was certainly a remarkable discovery. He said it was, that the carnivorous plants were the most wonderful plants in the world. So after tens of millions of years, and the other thing about Darwin is when you think about all the stuff that he found and that he observed that, and that he saw that carnivorous plants were the ones, the work, his work on carnivorous plants, he thought was his best work. I think that, I think that's very telling. So carnivorous plants, after tens of millions of years of juggling hunger and sex and these wonderful plants have evolved into effective and selective killers. And they've continued to mesmerize people of all ages, like these kids in Messina, Italy. Don't they, don't they look just glued to that. Oh my gosh, they're so surprising. So the two geezer Americans that were taking their picture were totally unnoticed because everybody was watching the guy make the picture, the Venus flytrap catch the bug. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick tour of peat bogs and their most famous residents, the carnivorous plants. So there we have it. Well, thank you, Ginny. We have time for questions. Yes, thank you. That's thank you. really interesting. Um, I, just two questions so far. If you have questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself at this point if you'd like, or hang on. Um, or um, you can type them. Um, just two questions so far in the chat. Um, I wondered with the water wheel, how come the enzymes don't get diluted by water? Um, because it, it's underwater. So they're secreting enzymes and they would just get thinned out. Well, the, the traps are water are watertight. Ah. So, so when they open, they suck the prey in and then they close up again. So gotcha. they, they are watertight. And so then they would not secrete those digestive juices until after something is trapped. That makes sense. All right, a question from Felicia Boyd. And where in Florida would you find the Venus flytrap? Are there any in Northeast Florida? Well, it's not native here. So if it's here, it was introduced. Uh, unfortunately for carnivorous plants as conservationists, they have been looted on a grand scale. So people are so interested in them that they want to dig them out and take them home. Um, so that is a problem. So if you want to have your own carnivorous plant, be sure to get them from a certified nursery so that we're not taking them from the wild. That's a very good point. When we were talking about a field trip, I wasn't aware of that, and Adam brought it up, that we didn't want to tell people we're going to this park, say, where we know there's carnivorous plants because we didn't want anyone to, not our members, but somehow other people, 
um, know, you know, find out this is a place where I can go and collect them. And that's one of the reasons we're thrilled to be going to the barbers because we don't have to worry about that. It's, it's um, somebody's private property. Um, all right, great job, fascinating, great talk. Thanks so Thank much, you. it's fascinating. Um, I, you know, I was Charles Darwin for plants to be catching the bugs and then having the enzymes secreted to digest them is just sort of mind boggling. Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, we think we're smart and that plants are just plants, but you know, the, the evolution of plants is just amazing and what they have worked out over the years in many ways. And, you know, again, I, I, I created this for the, for the cruise cruisers, because what I, what I like about talking to the people on the cruise ships is that this is a hard audience for environmental groups to reach. And um, if I can make them pay attention because I've got interesting stuff to talk about, then they're learning science in spite of themselves. And, you know, and, and people on a ship, you know, as the entertainer, I can't get away. I'm sitting there at the pool deck working on my stuff and they come by and they say, oh my gosh, Jenny, I'm learning so much. I should have majored in biology. It's just amazing. Or, you know, they, they just, um, but, you know, creating interesting presentations is not easy and I want to have six or eight oh my gosh moments in each one so it's a lot of work uh, but it is a plum job for me as an advocate for mother nature if I can get people interested in science and interested in looking at nature when they travel and not just the tourist attractions um, then, then I then I feel like I'm I'm doing my job as an advocate for Mother Nature. <laughs> Agreed. All right, we have two hands raised, and I'm not sure who put their hand up first. Mary, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Was that me, Mary? You yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you, I, Mary. No, I hadn't raised my hand, but I do have a question. Jenny, thank you so much. That was a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, a couple months ago, I was in Lowe's and they had some little bitty tiny uh, pitcher plant, uh, Venus flytrap, I think it was, in a, a little plastic box, so exquisitely set up. And I bought it thinking, am I going to be able to keep it alive? That I barely have, but I'm, I've got it in like a, a a glass almost like a vase a vase set down inside to keep drafts off it and it's on my kitchen window and i spray it every day should i just let it die a natural death or can i try <laughs> to keep it alive i can't answer that question you'll have to figure that out yourself but it is not easy to simulate a peat bog mm -hmm. which, which is where they grow so you need basically very few nutrients and very pure water. So you would not use tap water, you would use rainwater um, only. Okay. Um, because you, what you're trying to do is have a nutrient poor soil. And so you only use rainwater um, to do that. But again, um, you know, they're, they're native to the Carolinas. So that's where, that's where they're native to. So if I needed to transplant it because it's in a, a tiny little pot, should I try to get some peat and wet that peat and make a... If you want to keep it alive, that's what you'd have to do, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Diane Battle, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, I have, I guess I have a couple of real simple questions because I'm, my knowledge is so simple. Um, the, you said that the aquatic carnivorous plants don't have roots so much, they have modified leaves. Right. But the, the terrestrial, I mean, I know they're in a very wet environments, but do they have roots and do those roots function 
in any way other than to stabilize the plant, you know? Well, when they studied the pitcher plants, what they what they figured out was that the nutrients that they got from the pitchers went down to the roots. So all of that was transferred down to the roots and mm -hmm. then sent up as if they had absorbed them from the soil. <laughs> That's, so they're they're pretending to absorb. They're pretending, right? yeah. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty well, cool. Well, I mean, I mean that that's that's what the roots were evolved to do is to mm -hmm. absorb the nutrients. It's just that the nutrients come from above instead of from below. That's, that's <laughs> fair. It's, so they have to keep some traditions alive, I guess, because they I have guess, the structures. I guess. Yeah, yes. um, and do do they do any of these carnivorous plants? Um, you know. Uh, the word just went right out of my head. And it's such a simple, produce sugars, you know. Um, do they produce oh, any? Oh, sure. Yeah, they, they, okay. they, they do photosynthesize, yes. That's, thank you. That word went um, out of my mind. Yeah, they, yeah. they do, but you need nutrients in order to photosynthesize. They, right. they, they need the nitrogen to photosynthesize. Mm -hmm. They need the phosphorus. They need all of those nutrients in order for the photosynthesis to take place. Right, right. But, so then, it's... but then they do produce the sugars like mm -hmm. most other photosynthetic plants. Okay, so they're getting their nutrients from above, sending it to the roots for the terrestrial plants, sending it to the roots, taking it in, pretending it's from the soil, and then they can photosynthesize. Right. So. <laughs> okay. Thank so, you. Very good. So Very good. The, the bugs are almost like fertilizer. Where, um, oh, they are. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, here's a thing. question in the chat, which is actually pretty interesting um, from Francisco Ortiz. Could you use carnivorous plants to help with insect control? Since I grow carnivorous plants, I notice that some species are very effective at controlling some insect populations. I would not use carnivorous plants as part of my integrated pest management in my in my gardens because the carnivorous plants are not easy to have in your yard and in your garden. Um, it would be better to use more conventional plants to, uh, I mean, I, I just uh, had a review of a book called Plant Partners, I know this is backwards, by Jessica Walliser um, on, my, on, on my blog. And there is now scientific plant partnering. And one of the partners that you put in your gardens, in well, particularly the edible gardens, um, is sweet alyssum. And the sweet alyssum attracts predator bugs so you you would use stuff like that instead of carnivorous plants um some some because alyssum is easy to grow um a conventional plant again i would not recommend having carnivorous plants as pets <laughs> well I, i'm picturing a big tub with pitcher plants on the patio instead of citronella candles having your pitcher plants handy Okay, <laughs> but you know it's not going to be easy to keep them. That yeah. that 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 that's the trick. And again, we don't want to be um, recommending that people go out and dig them out of the bogs. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> well, gosh, um, do we have any more questions? I have I have one other piece of information. If it's a nice day on the twenty fourth when we have our native plant sale, mm -hmm. I will bring I will bring my books to the, to the native plant sale. Oh, but if um, it's a rainy day, I will not. But if it's if it's a nice day, I'll I'll bring my table and my books, and I'll be happy to talk to people um, about this or whatever anything else. I'll be I'll be available. Uh, I'll come anyway. But if it's a, if it's a nice day, I'll bring my books. So we'll have a pop-up sale. Yes. And um, as I mentioned, for those of you who, who don't aren't familiar with Jenny, with her blog and her Facebook, she's extremely knowledgeable. Um, one whole part of what she does is talk about organic gardening 
in Florida. So growing vegetables, which is not part of the Native Plant Society, but um, to have her there and be able to chat with her, it's, she's full of information about all kinds of great stuff. Um, yeah, I'm supposed to be retired, but I turned in the manuscript for my sixth book a couple of months ago now. So <laughs> I'm working on the seventh book project now. So yeah, active retirement. And we're actually we're kind of in a way because of COVID, she's here. Otherwise, she'd be off at sea somewhere. So somewhere, yeah, um, somewhere. Um, well, I don't see any more questions in the chat. I see a number of, of thank you, loving it, great talk. Um, from the barbers, looking forward to seeing everyone on the field trip. As I say, there were a uh, number of spaces left. So if you'd like to go, um, send an email to ixiachapter at gmail.com, which I can put in the chat. Unfortunately, I will not be able to come because I'm running a workshop that afternoon. <laughs> which I won't be there because I'm attending the workshop. Um, yeah, so, well, your field trips in the morning, but uh, I yeah, I might double dip. Um, so if you'd like to see some of these plants alive and I hope maybe even flowering, um, the barbers is a great place to see it. And if there's no more questions, then we'll wrap up. And thank you very much, Jenny. As always, really interesting stuff. I'm with Darwin. That's just crazy. It really is. Crazy. I mean, I didn't even know that he had written that book um you know until i started doing the research which is why i love it because you know you find out all these things yeah all right well oh, wait hang on sir just thanks again just wonderful in the chat yeah. all right thank you bye, everybody bye everybody thank you, thank you jenny good night You're welcome bye 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 thank you thanks so much <laughs>